Welcome to Hello Self. It's a podcast focused on turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I am your host, coach, and author, Patricia Leonard. Hello there. I am Patricia Leonard, and I am your host for Hello Self Podcast. If you've been on our show before, then you know that our mission is about helping you turn your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. We want to help you get those dreams and goals off that someday shelf and start living them now. Recently, I have been putting a podcast out on Hello Self with regard to the law of attraction around relationships. And this podcast tonight is series number six, and the title of it is What is Love? Now, just in a quick review of series five, We talked a little bit about the components of communication and that communication is a fundamental pillar of any relationship. We talked about three basic aspects of effective communication. They're threefold. The first one is a speaker. The speaker has the responsibility for introducing or sharing an idea, or a topic. Then the second aspect of communication is a listener. And a listener's role is to receive and observe the information. And the third aspect of any communication is the information shared. So as a listener, your responsibility, as we talked about in Series 5, is to receive what is being given to you by the speaker and observe that. And then communication can happen after that because then there's an interaction. Tonight, we're going, as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about what is love. And you're going to find out, which I did as I was doing some research on this, Love is very difficult to define. And here's what I'd like to do is start this series on what is love from the Bible. So what does the Bible say or say about what love is? Here is the quote from the Bible. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. So you can see, as we were talking about communication, it uh, filters over into the aspect of love. So if we love somebody, we're going to hear what they have to say, and then we're going to observe and create a communication about it, or at least have an interaction. And not to boast, not to put somebody down, but to remember. Love is kind. So I went on doing some more research, and here's what I found. It says, though most have experienced love in their life in some aspect, love is, defining love is challenging. We quote the words all the time. As a matter of fact, I hardly hang up on a telephone call, regardless of who it is without saying, I love you. So recently, as I was putting this podcast together, I thought, Patricia, is that just a habit? Or is there something behind it that adds value? 
that honors the other person. That is more than just a word. Because I think the struggle in our society today is that we just use words and we never think about the impact or what it really means or why we're even saying it. It's become a habit. If we were to ask ourselves, and me, I did that, we would probably stammer and stutter. I did. What do you mean by hanging up? Every time you hang up, you say, I love you. <laughs> and so I had to stop and say, I do truly love people. And I just realized that we may, the quote that we do with each other as we hang up may be the only time that a person is told, I love you that day. And maybe they don't even listen to it. Maybe they don't even hear me saying, I love you. I don't exaggerate it. I simply say, I love you. Talk to you tomorrow, or I'm looking forward to our interview, or something like that. But it has become a habit with me of just saying that and not even understanding if it might upset some people. But I tell you, I have not had somebody come back, regardless of the position they're in, and say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? So it obviously has not been offensive, but I'm also the kind of person that I, I don't tiptoe around. So I think that maybe our behavior starts to make them believe. But anyway, regardless, when we say I love you to a child, what does that really mean? When we say I love you to somebody we're working with or to a client that I have, I want to make sure that they know I love them and I have their best interests. Now, some people would never say that in a professional environment. I went to get my license renewed today and the gentleman said, we're, we're almost closing. And I said, could you help me? Because it was a kiosk I had to use, and I'd never done that before. And so I thought it was very interesting. He said, we're very busy, and we're getting ready to close. But guess what happened? He stayed right there, and we ran through it and got it done. And I said, God bless you. I love you. I don't know if he paid any attention or not, but I truly did because I didn't want to have to go through that process again. But anyway, in my research, I ran across Robert Steinberg, who in 1986 introduced a triangular theory of love. And I was intrigued by this, and it keeps it simple, too, and easy for us to begin to understand where we are in a love process. And he talks about three different aspects of it. He is one of the most influential psychologists of the 20th century, best known for his groundbreaking research in intelligence, love, creativity, and cognitive styles. He has the gamut of the things that we need to think about. What is love? Creativity. And it's the aspects of us that we communicate with because intelligence, love in a loving way, creative ways to might be a note you write, cognitive lifestyles. You've got to be able to think and understand what is being what is happening and what love is really about. It's not always about saying, I love you. Sometimes there's unspoken love that is more powerful. I was working with a gentleman on a project and I needed some water. And I said, just a minute, I need to go get some water. I know I've told this story in some of the other podcasts, but without hesitation, he brought me some water. You can say I love you in a lot of different ways, or you can express love. You don't even have to say I love you. You can express love by, let's say, a leader giving credit to somebody in his team or her team. A sports group, you're the coach. 
I coach my hockey, giving people the accolades that they deserve. Another way to say I love you. But anyway, back to Robert Steinberg's triangular theory. The triangular theory of love that he's talking about is understood by applying three components. One, passion. Two, intimacy. And three, commitment. This theory suggests that people can have varying degrees of intimacy, varying degrees of passion, and commitment at any moment in time. And what he has done, he's divided these up into this theory and these three different categories so we can begin to, where am I? If you're thinking about a relationship with, a partner or a friend or something. The intimacy part, you might, and we're going to describe each of these, but you might be able to say, or the passion part, let's just take that one first. You might be able to say that you guys are passionate about the same kind of thing. I love sports. So I like to be around people who love to watch sports. Passionate about the job you do. You may like filmmaking and you want to be around more people that do filmmaking. However, if you see the passion dying, like sometimes I'm over this job. So it's a way to begin to measure where you are in this love affair or this love theory. Do I still feel, do I still have passion? for this organization? Do I still have passion for the job that I'm doing? Do I still have passion for this person? We're going to talk about what each of those are. Some of those components are focused on the love between two people in a romantic, sexual, or sexual relationship. But just as we just talked about, they can also apply to other forms of interpersonal relationships. As I just said, it can apply to job. It can apply to learning. I mean, I've got a passion now about exploring more about relationships. I may even take this into a book <laughs> uh, without a scientific background except quoting a few people. But because I am, I want to know more. I look at our society, and I believe it looks as if sometimes we don't value relationships. I think in the political system, we don't value each other. We, I, I just think that that love, if we could really understand what love is, we could begin to communicate, as I told you in the first one, series number five, we could communicate more effective. And that's without dishonoring somebody else because we're a society that I don't care. We dishonor people because of their ethnicity. We, di we dishonor people because of the way they speak or just all kinds of things. Seems to me like, Love would be so much easier, and that's why I was so excited about this piece, is that love is what the world needs now. <laughs> yeah. Intimacy. Let's go into looking at these three components now. Intimacy, which involves feelings of closeness, connectedness, and bondedness. This can relate to individuals who work together, pray together, sports teams. It's reflecting on connections between teams and people and organizations. As a matter of fact, what is one that we just have experienced? The 2024 Olympics. Those individuals on those teams yell for their teammates as much as they do for themselves. And if they get a silver and their teammate gets a gold, they're celebrating that person. 
because at the core of who they are, it's love. Because remember, love is not jealous. Love does not put somebody down. The biblical version of what love is really says it all. It is a perfect guideline for all of us. But I was, as I was going through this, I was thinking about, wow, these Olympic teams, they're family. The United States went over there in all kinds of, and so did China, and so did every other organization that was there. But they go over as in intimacy, in feeling the connectedness, the closeness, the bondedness. Then the second theory that he talked about, in the uh, second uh, component in the theory of love, is passion. And passion, which involves feelings and desires that lead to physical attraction. So it might be that, let's take the gentleman that gave me the water. I saw him in a different way after that. So sometimes that can lead to physical attraction, romance, because what you do is you experience something at a deeper level. And Sandberg or Steinberg calls that passion. So it says that it can lead to physical attraction, romance, and sexual consummation, and may begin with closeness, connectedness. So the first of it, the intimacy, can be the real introduction to, to seeing something deeper in one of your teammates or one of the people you pray with at church or somebody that you're in a class with or you play pickleball with. <laughs> so it you have common interests, perhaps, but at least you see them through a deeper element of what love is. So it's, and it can take on the physical attraction. I like the way she's bubbly and I really like to be around her. I like to be around him because he's a character. He's always laughing and joking. Or I like to be around this individual because I see them as very intelligent. As a matter of fact, I have a couple of people in my life that I really, I like to go and hear what they have to say. I'm going through this transition, I say to them, and here's what I'm trying to get clear about. And I really, because I see them as intelligent and stepping back from the what I'm caught up in and give me a different perspective. So true. But And I have a passion, attraction for them in a passionate kind of way because I like the way they think. Now, those things can lead to romance or sexual relationship. So it, it doesn't have to, but, but I think passion is, and it can start with closeness because you find out who somebody is and then you want to pick their brain or get their ideas or whatever. And so it's the first person you think about when you really want some guidance. Okay, and the third component is commitment. Commitment involves feelings that lead a person to remain with someone and move toward shared goals. So the commitment, which makes sense, is you the intimacy, you're, you feel close to them or you feel um, some kind of connection then passion, you start to notice them physically, intellectually, and maybe a part of a group. And so we, we tend to move toward a tribe of people that we enjoy, who they are, what they represent. Then to commitment. So commitment is when you talk, communicate effectively, and 
you find you have shared goals. This level can escalate to a deeper meaning and involve a deeper level of commitment between two people based upon the components of intimacy and passion. So based, it doesn't always have to. So sometimes it can just be that the commitment is to help them with some of their goals. It doesn't always have to be a relationship. It doesn't always have to be a sexual or romantic relationship. And that's why I like his theory, because it is not always focused on lust or sex or whatever, It's but it is focused on three particular components. That way we can sort through a lot easier and we're not asking ourselves, am I in love with this person or what's going on? It doesn't mean you aren't, but it causes you to explore a little bit more. So finding a balance between the psychological need for sex and the need for love is essential. And the complete absence of all of these three components is categorized in non-love. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of the components of love that he talks about. A love, he talked, this is a triangular love theory. A triangle, a love triangle is not the same thing as a triangular theory of love. So a love triangle. In a love triangle, three people may either be involved in a polyamorous relationship or two people may compete for the love of a third person. So his theory is not about that. It's about individual um, components of what he describes as love. And I like that that he separates these and gives us a clear understanding of what his theory is. Now, Steinberg says that these three components of love interact, and I think you're starting to see that, that interact in a systemic manner. The presence of one component or a combination of two or more components creates seven kind of love experiences. So you can have two or three, no, two or three of these, then it gives you a different combination of experiences. And we've just been highlighting a little bit about that. So the presence of one component or a comp, and I'm going to give you what he talks about some of the components or a combination of two or more components create seven kinds of love experiences. Now, here's what he says are the seven love experiences. He says, one, friendship. It's a component of liking. Infatuation, you can start to see. So we get infatuated with somebody. Empty love. We it, we don't understand. Now, in the next series, I'm going to cover all of these components or I'll write a paper about it that you can get through me. But empty love, and we'll describe what that is today just for the sake of the things that I'm trying to cover in this podcast. We'll, we'll only highlight one. Romantic love. And so you can see it might incorporate two or three pieces of uh, the, the components that he describes to get to that experience. So it might be intimacy and then passion and maybe commitment. So you can begin to see that these different levels of uh, love experiences might take two or three of those components or might only deal with one. Okay, another one is companion love. And so it's simply that we're looking for someone and it might be in the uh, intimacy, might be like I said with the Paris Olympics. It just might be that we want to be part of, we just want to be a companion with them. Or 
We just want a companion in our lives to travel with, someone that we can have dinner with. So it depends upon the various components that we, or the triangular pieces, where we are in that. So the intimacy, it might stop there. But we will look at the components that make up these different experiences. Then the next one is fatuation love. So you've got a fatuation type of love, and you can begin to guess where these fit in. Does that take in intimacy and passion or commitment? So you're, we're going to go deeper in these, but I wanted you to at least know what he's caught talking about in the seven experiences of love. And then later on, either in a paper or another podcast, we'll talk about each how what the components of each of these require. And then cons- consummate love. You can begin to see that the three triangular theories of love that he's got covers a broad understanding of relationships and friendships. So you can be in a relationship with somebody and you can have two components. You can be in a relationship that there is no love and it's just more about the intimacy uh, portion. Or it could even be the passion without love in it, just attractiveness to uh, the intelligence of someone. So we'll go into all of those. But the thing I like about his theory and these experiences, it helps us to make sense. Am I in love? The first one I did was, is attraction love? What is it? Are we in love with somebody when we're attracted to them? Or is there an element of love? It can be, depending upon the components. But I think it helps you stop for a moment. and Because I think sometimes we jump into what we think is love. Quote, love. And we don't really know what it is. When you're a little one, a teenager, you have these little pet, these little lovey things. But let me tell you. When you grow up, I've experienced that recently in my own life that I ask myself, is this love I'm feeling? I'm so confused. <laughs> That's why I'm doing these relationship part because I want to learn more. I just, I want to learn more. And then I can deal with relationships in the more proper alignment based upon his theory only but I think I can rationalize in my mind, Patricia, you're just fascinated because that guy ha- is a fabulous tennis player and you're attracted to him because of that. Doesn't necessarily mean I'm in love with him. And I think a lot of times the, we get love all confused and then it ends up in heartbreak or we don't want to talk about love because. Oh, they'll take the wrong idea and then it'll just create nothing. But so people in relationships hesitate to say, I love you. Because what does it mean to the other person? Remember, effective communication. (laughs) So if somebody says, I love you, maybe you say, what do you mean by that? If you say, what do you mean by that? Then it starts another (laughs) communication blunder or detail to go into. So I think that not trying to create something out of it, but just knowing where you are in the intimacy, the passion, or the, what was the third one? The, what, how did I forget that? Commitment. Yeah. So I said I would cover one of these experiences he's talking about. So Let's explore the first one, and we'll cover the remainder in a later, or I'll either write a paper about it that you can get through through one of my podcasts, and I'll, I'll put my emails and stuff out there, my website. Okay, friendship. The components of friendship 
is liking. Remember, we said that all of these experiences engages one or two or three components of his triangular love theory. So in friendships, components there are liking. We will we'll like and we'll share messages and we'll we'll like the person and we want them on our team, not because we love them, but we like them. So we become friends. So this type of love is when the intimacy or liking component is present. So that's the very first of his um, components or theory, triangular theory of love. But feelings of passion and or commitment in the romantic sense are missing. So in friendship, it's just the component of liking. And sometimes we have a hard time beginning to, is this a friendship or a love affair? (laughs) Oh, we're a complicated society, aren't we? Humanity. (laughs) But anyway, so the romance and the passion or commitment in the romantic sense are missing. Friendship love can be the root of other forms of love. However, it can begin there. You go, you're a friend and you like to go to the theater. So you go together. And maybe the third or fourth time you go to the theater, you think, dang, I really like sitting beside this person. (laughs) And I love our conversations afterwards. But you like someone for their kindness. Remember, that's exactly what started me on relationship. And I asked myself, am I attracted to that person or not? I was all confused. You like someone for their kindness, playing tennis. See, I like you as a partner. Their personality, pickleball. My girlfriend's so into pickleball. Or uh, watching the Olympic Games that I'm referring back to then, because they will cheer as much for the persons that's on their team as they will themselves. Uh, It's a friend and it's a liking. And when I like you, I want you to be a winner too. I want you to feel good about what you're doing. And we may be on the same team, but I may not be very good that day. So I think liking is we can, we just want to be around them because we have common interest or because they're very nice and kind and we like the same kind of events. We have a lot of common values. So friendship can be at that point right there. You just hang with them. Regardless of what age, whether you're a teenager or a six-year-old. I remember Greer when he was in daycare. He had a little friend named Tommy. They were best friends. They liked each other. We went on vacations together. And liking is, to me, it's a great place to start. Because if we start in the middle on some of the other things, and we can have passion and liking friendship at the same or intimacy at the same time. Because remember, it just takes it to a deeper level. Friendship is the kind of things that um, it keeps it out of the intimacy and keeps it out of the sexual. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just doesn't, it's not where its focus is. The focus is. We just like hanging. Or sometimes we just like to to have a quiet dinner and sit and do nothing. Not book, but our cell phones. (laughs) But maybe just talk about a situation that we both have common interest in. So you can begin, I hope that you begin to see how this all fits. And then we will cover these uh, components of uh, the different experiences we have with other individuals and out of intimacy, passion, and um, commitment 
we can see that there's all kinds of relationships or friendships or experiences that we can experience. <laughs> yeah. Consummate love is made up of three components and is the total form of love. And we will cover that a little bit more. It rep represents an ideal relationship. So that says it's covering all of these various components that we just talked about, intimacy, passion, and commitment. Okay. Knowing how the components interact may help highlight areas that may need improvement. So that's why I think Steinberg did this. We have an opportunity to heal ourselves around love if we know to where to pinpoint what's going on. And he says, for example, that the passion, let us say the passion has gone out of a relationship. It doesn't have to be a sexual or marriage relationship. It can be a relationship that you are on a team and the passion has gone out of it. Or it can be the passion for your work. I don't have any passion about this job anymore. I'm just ready for something else. So you don't love it anymore. You don't love doing the job. You don't love doing the work. So you can see how these can go because it's your relationship with work. Everything we are is about the relationships that we experience with where we live, with the people we experience, with the work we do. You see what I'm saying? What is love? It's much more than sex or lust or romance. However, he points out that it's good if we've got something to measure it against so we don't get all lost in what we think is love and it's really attraction to the work the person does or the way they manage the leadership styles they have. Just the... And we don't think, I don't, let me speak for myself. I don't think about that often, but I have really start, started thinking about that now. I go to the gym and I think about the relationship that I have with those young people at the front desk. You see, everything is bigger than what we like to make it. We want to put everything in a little box. This is what it means. No, no. And that's why communication is so, I, I know I'm talking about series five, but that's why communication is so important because we can run off with our concept or our feeling of something, what love is, and the other person, that's not how they're experiencing it. And unless we have effective communication, We don't know where it's going, and we just may play this game and both people be miserable. Or they get married or they get in a relationship, and then they hurt each other. So if we could just define, what does love mean to you? Or what does loving me mean to you? And I know that I said at the front end of this that I say I love you to everybody when I hang up. And since I've been doing this, I've really asked myself that question. And I'm not in love with everybody. However, I do love everybody. I do. I see, oh my God, I do. I don't know. I've not always been this way, and it's not just about this, but I, I love. That's all I know. Even if I don't agree with somebody, oh, yeah, my emotions will, at first will say, oh, yeah, you, you just think you're cool. However, I step back and say, Patricia, love that person and maybe it'll help them start loving themselves because I really believe 
the first thing, and I'm going to bring up something that I think you've all been exposed to, but is if we can't love ourselves, we do not have the capacity to love someone else. We don't. I've been through two marriages and a long-term relationship, and I wanted to blame the other person. However, the more I understand Patricia Leonard, the more I understand I didn't love myself. I felt like I was less than. Yeah. And I bet you a lot of you out there feel that way too. About yourself. So this is the point I want to bring up something for those of you who are in corporate or you like to read. You may have read this uh, corporate book, and we do a lot of training around this, but it goes back to that core idea that to love others, you have to first learn how to love yourself. And so I said, this reminds me of my corporate days when speaking and coaching corporate teams and leaders, the concept that influence and impact begins with us. So if we want to influence others, we have to learn to love ourselves so we come from a loving presence. Because you may try to fool people, but we all know I'm faking it. I know when you're faking it and you're just saying it because, oh, this is what leaders say, or this is what somebody says that's been dating for five years. Or this is what, I'm a mom and this is what I say to my son, no. They only get it if you mean it. But this model that we caught, taught in corporate America and taught in churches and every place as team building, but this model is titled Circles of Influence by Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey in his Circle of Influences says that love, understanding, and influence begins with self. And if you remember, it's uh, circles. And in the middle is a small circle. Until you love that small circle, you cannot influence any of the other circles. Because when you learn to love yourself, it ripples out and automatically. And I think that's what I'm going through now. I finally fell in love with Patricia Leonard. And now I feel love for everybody else. And I just tell them. I just tell them, love you. Talk to you tomorrow. Hey, how you feeling today, John? Oh, good. I'm glad you're feeling better. Love you. See you later. Yeah. It just is an automatic. And let me tell you, I've got a big ego as anybody else. <laughs> and you all that know me know that. But it's becoming natural now. And it's not something I fake. It's really it. But he says the influence and the understanding be of love really begins with self. We must first love ourselves before we can experience a life of love. And that's what I'm experiencing now. I get compliments from people that I, uh, why are they saying that to me? What? I don't even know. You don't even know me. How can you? But it's like I'm seen in a different light and I'm realizing now that it's because I see me in a different light, finally. And you know what? We can blame all the dysfunctional homes that we grew up in because I did. But we can keep blaming, oh, it's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault. It was, it was the neighbors. It was uh, grandma. It was, oh, that bully in school. Yeah, we can make excuses forever, but guess who you're cheating out of love? Yeah, I'm over that. But anyway, there's another, one more aspect, and then I'm going to wrap it up tonight. But I found this, and I absolutely had to share it with you. It's on the lighter side of the question, what is love? And I think it's going to ring a bell with you. Take it in with me. Listen to this. 
According to one explanation, the key to love's ancient purpose lies in the apartment lease agreement. Apartment lease agreement. Love is like signing a lease. Why do people agree to years-long leases for apartments? After all, the tenant might soon find a better apartment and the landlord could find a better tenant. The answer is that searching for that perfect apartment or tenant is such an annoying and costly process that both parties are better off making a long-term commitment to an imperfect but sufficient lease. We may make a commitment to somebody as we look at those three components. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be per perfect. Neither does it with a lease. We're just betting on that we're going to this we're going to love this apartment. It's going to be exactly what we want for the rest of our lives. Or it's like making a commitment. Because you know the heartache, you know the breaking up. I just saw this movie today. Oh my gosh. What is the name of that? Ends with us. It ends with us. Oh my gosh. You got to go see it. But it was a series of behaviors carried on, abusive relationships. And they were getting the idea of love confused. So do you take abuse because you love the person? Or is love your long-term lease? Or are you confused? You don't even love yourself. So pattern after pattern in this family, they were allowing somebody to beat them up. And in this case, it happened to be a woman allowing. And then the child saw it. And then she grew up and married. And then she was in that. And she finally said to, and they had a conversation. I loved it. It was an effective communication between the guy that she said she loved and he loved her. But because of some things that had happened, traumatic things that happened in his life, he still had a lot of healing to love himself. So it, it was exactly this. And so we'll stay in the name of love. No, think about when you sign that paper. And I know this may sound like it's out of alignment with the Bible. It is not out of alignment because I don't think God or Jesus or any of your higher powers ever expected you to be beat up. And the same goes for men. Women beat up on men in a relationship. So it doesn't, or any kind of abuse, it doesn't have to be a physical abuse, mental, emotional. All of those can put you in the prison of what we call love. And if you think about the jobs we get, in some ways, we allow ourselves to be kept in prison by the, well, you got a job kind of thing, the income that you get with that company, and yet you don't get the promotion, you don't get the opportunity, you don't. And you have to decide, do I love this company that much? Do I love this human being that much? And I wanted to take it outside of just romance because it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. And when we only think of that, let's say that you don't love your job anymore. Guess what else that impacts? You're impatient with your children, so you don't love them as much. You may still love them, but you don't act like it. You abuse them with words or no talking. Or you don't like your job and your husband says, how was your day, honey? I don't want to talk about it. See, it just, or that. Wife says, how did you do on your event today, your pickleball? I don't want to talk about it. 
it just, it kills love. So we have no circle of influence going out there. But I think that hopefully, if nothing else, you don't beat yourself up about this, but it makes you more aware, just like I have been describing in my own. Let me tell you, because I'm doing this does not mean that I've got it all figured out. But in the research, I'm learning. And I ask myself these questions. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? The signed lease agreement, this is with um, apartments, provides the crucial bond, keeping the temptation of other options from running their useful arrangement. Running their useful arrangement. So you see what happens when you've made a commitment on a lease, you're not going to fall for, I only, we only charge this here and we give you free Wi-Fi. And so you're going to be torn if you sign the lease and a commitment, you know what you signed for. And don't be ripping yourself apart all the time and tearing that love down then you find all kinds of things wrong with the apartment. You find all things are wrong with your relationship. Everything at work is awful. So what we do is then we start looking at what ain't. And then nobody gets loved, not even ourselves. But I thought that was an interesting concept that I wanted to bring in, signing of a lease. This ought to make you think about when you do commit something to somebody and you say, I love you, what is that lease about? Yeah, what's that lease about? Okay, right. What, one thing that I always like to do at the end of these, thank you. And I hope you have a better understanding of what love is or at least more questions. <laughs> what I always like to do is end up with a quote by a famous person or a couple of quotes. So here are two that I found for this today. Life with love is like a tree without, oh, excuse me. Life without love is like a tree without blossoms or fruit. Khalil Gabrion, Amer uh, Lebanese American poet. He's all, I love his stuff. Oh, I've got a little book that was written by him. I think it's called The Prophet, I believe. And then here's the second quote that I really like. Rules for happiness, something to do, someone to love, something to hope for. Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher. But I like that. Rules for happiness, something to do, Someone to love and something to hope for. Oh, yes. Emmanuel Kant, a German philosopher. And now I'm going to wrap it up. I promise that I'm going to wrap it up with a look at the future of the podcast that I'm going to be putting out on the law of attraction. Okay, one of them in, and I don't know if this is going to be series seven. At first I said it would be, but I'll decide when I get to that. But the law of attraction and relationships, it is my intent to highlight some thoughts on the topic of manifesting love. Can we create through, and this is basically what the law of attraction says, that you have the power to manifest. So I'm going, and some of you probably have read the book, The Secret. I've got the book and I've also got the audio tape. But the book, The Secret, highlighted an awareness that we as individuals have the power to manifest. We will explore in this particular series what it takes to manifest love according to those experts in The Secret. I know they talk about manifesting wealth and manifesting, uh, uh, you know, we're going to win this day. But I, um, I wanted to go ahead and because they talked about love in there. And I want, since this is a topic, I wanted to go ahead and do that. So it may be the seven or I may change it. 
Here's another one that I want to do on the law of attraction and relationships. What does age have to do with it? And I just started looking at some research on that, and you're going to be shocked because in this day and age, um, just like Cher, there's a big gap between she, I think 30-some years between, or maybe even 40, between she and the man she dates. And you may say to me, oh, that's Hollywood. No, I have a friend that is, they've been married for 30 some years now, but he's 25 years younger than her. But he said, I love you. So five years, she said, no. And I said, are you still happy? She said, yes. And we're retired and we don't fight. (laughs) Oh, and another one I want to do, and I'm going to do, the future of love in the digital age. So what is this going to do? (laughs) What's the digital age? How's it going to change what we call what is love in the digital age? So thank you for being here tonight. I hope you had as much fun as I did in presenting this series six on what is love. And we've only begun to touch some of the pieces, but I want to get some other topics in too. So we may jump back to this and talk about what love, the different experiences we can have with the different components of love. So in closing, I am Patricia Leonard and I am your host on Hello Self Podcast. I'm so grateful that you were here and so hoping that some of the things that I share in my research and in my own stories make a difference in your life because I believe that in every story, there are many gifts and lots of glories. And what I always say when I'm closing out is keep dreaming. Thank you for joining Hello Self today, and may it offer insight and inspire you to stay on your runway to success. Like, share, and subscribe, and remember this, keep dreaming.